right to it. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Dion Filmer. I'm the Director of Research here at the, at the World Bank. Um, just uh, welcome everybody to this. This is the second uh, webinar in the Economics of Deep Trade Agreements series. Uh, there's one coming up next week, uh, if I'm correct. Um, today, the focus is on uh, deep trade agreements, political economy, and market power. And the, the framing is we're going to have th uh, three sessions of 30 minutes each. Hopefully, the presentation is about 20 minutes. So please, you know, try to stick to that, presenters. So we have at least like, 10 minutes for Q&A and discussion after each presentation. Um, so with that, let's go to the first presentation, which is okay. the lobbying by firms on deep, deep trade agreements. So okay, cool. I'm not sure who the presenter is, but but uh, let them. Can you see me? Go. I'm important. Can you see my screen? Paola, yes, we can see you and we can hear okay, you. Okay, cool. Very good. So let me start straight away and I'm going to start my watch. So as, as I was saying to, you know, the other speakers before, this is quite exciting because all of us are presenting for the first time our project. So this paper, like all the others, has never been presented. And so I'm very much looking forward to your comments and suggestions. It's joint work with Michael and Mathieu, with whom I've worked uh, before, and with Insong at MIT. And the motivation is probably common to most of these uh, papers in this webinar series. And that is the fact that if you look at the last few decades, one of the key phenomena has been the surge in the number of regional trade agreements, in particular free trade agreements, and not only in their numbers, but also in their debts. So increasingly trade agreements include provisions that go well beyond the traditional trade policy. And uh, for example, if you look at what Danny Roddick has argued, as, you know, he has compared in his recent paper in the Journal of Economic Perspective two trade agreements uh, negotiated by the US 10 years apart with countries of similar size, Israel and Singapore. And uh, the agreement with Israel was only 8,000 words long, while the one with Singapore 70,000 words. And even if you look at specific provisions on particular policy issues such as IPR, uh, the earlier one was up to a third of a page on IPR, and the more recent agreement has more than 23 pages and two side letters. And this is the kind of also increasing depth that we can now measure with the World Bank new data set. What Danny Roderick has argued is that deep trade agreements are the result of rent seeking, self interested behavior on the part of politically well connected firms, international banks, pharmaceutical companies, and multinationals. And these kind of concerns about the role that multinational or large corporations can play in shaping the content of trade agreements has also been echoed in some of the protests against CETA and TTIP here in Europe. So the, the, the agreements between Europe and Canada and Europe and the US. And there were a lot of concerns about the fact that large companies, particularly multinational American ones, were trying to push provisions in the agreement that were favorable concerning investment, you know, dispute settlement, various kinds of standards, etc. Notwithstanding these uh, heated academic and policy debates, we actually know very little about the role that large companies can play in shaping trade agreements. If you look at lobbying reports, which is something we're going to look at in this paper, there is some anecdotal evidence suggesting the role that is right. Because, for example, when you look at uh, reports filed during the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, you see many companies that lobby and specifically tell you that they are lobbying on particular provisions. An example is Glaxo, which in the first quarter of 2012 reports spending over $2 million lobbying on TPP provisions related to intellectual property. And you can see many other reports filed by Glaxo that are similar and other pharmaceutical companies filing similar reports. And indeed, when you look at the text of the TPP agreement that the President Obama signed in 2016, it contains various provisions that are favorable to drug manufacturers, such as strengthening patent exclusivity. And interest, interestingly, since President Trump withdrew the US from TPP, these provisions have actually been removed from the agreement that is now in force without the US. So this does suggest that companies try to shape the content of trade agreements and try to include provisions that are favorable to them. What we do in this paper is to try to study this more systematically. And we do so first developing a simple theoretical model 
that allows us to study lobbying by heterogeneous firms, both on the extensive margin, whether they are politically organized or not, but also on the intensive margin, how much they spend lobbying on particular policy issues. And then we bring the predictions of this model to the data, constructing novel firm level lobbying data set and merging this data with the new data set uh, by you know, Aditya, Nadia, and Michele that allows us to study issue debts in trade agreement of various policy issues. And we, I'm going to show you that uh, Danny uh, was right in the sense that the extent of lobbying by firms in trade agreements, specific lobbying on particular policy issues, is reflected in the coverage of this provision in the trade agreement. So let me be very brief on any, on everything because it's tight, and in particular on the literature. So we are building on three main streams of literature. The first is the political economy of FTAs, and this is the first paper to look at lobbying by heterogeneous firms on deep trade agreements, on the content of trade agreements. Uh, the second literature we're building on is the, is the literature on firm heterogeneity in trade, and in particular, our model builds on the work by Maya Melit and Ottaviano, their AER paper in 2014 and their 2020 RISTA paper. And finally, uh, we are, of course, uh, related to the whole literature on deep trade agreements, uh, which includes you know, work by Nuno, for example, uh, and, and many other papers, or many other people who are in the audience, and, and all the papers that I'm in this webinar series. So these are papers that look at non tariff provisions you know, in deep trade agreements. Uh, okay, let me sketch briefly the model for you. So we have a one sector economy, but we can extend the analysis to multiple sector without any loss of generality. And the sector is monopolistically competitive. You have a continuum of firms which differ in productivity and product scope, as in the Meyer Melitz of Taviano papers. And the firms have a core productivity, core competence that's going to be captured by this productivity fee for the core product as in the Eckel and Miri Rista paper. Then, you know, demand for a product is, is a function of the price of the product and this aggregate, uh, you know, the function of the price vector of all the variety, lambda capital. You can write down then the profits of uh, multi-product firms that is an endogenous product scope N. And what you can show in this kind of models is that firms that are more profitable will be larger uh, so, we'll, sorry, more productive firms are larger, more profitable, and have a larger price. They produce more product. And the further away you move from your core competence, the less are your per product profits. So, this is very standard in this multi product firm literature. What we embed is that model into a political structure in which firms uh, choose, first of all, whether to be politically organized or not. And this is modeled with a fixed cost. And this fixed cost captures, for example, the fact that firms can decide to set up an in-house lobbying department. Most of the firms that are actually lobbying on trade agreements and very large lobbying departments. So this can be the fixed cost, or the fixed cost can be, you know, figuring out which lobbying firm you may want to hire to connect to which politician. So this can be broader. Once you pay this fixed lobbying, lobbying cost, you can then be influential politically. So you can lobby to include in a in a bill, provisions that are favorable to you. And the way we model them is uh, these are firm product specific provisions that basically boost demand for your product. So there is a bill, this can be a domestic bill or it can be an FTA bill in the case of a trade agreement. And you're going to try to include in this bill, if you're organized, provisions that are favorable to you. And the probability that these provisions are included in the bill depends on your lobbying. And uh, you can then characterize the extensive margin of lobby. So there's going to be selection into lobby by the largest, most productive firms, which are the ones that produce more products. And this is the condition that characterizes a subset of politically organized firms. And firms, the larger they are among the lobbying firms, the more uh, they should spend and the more issues they should lobby on, the more provision they should try to include in this group. So the model is very simple, but delivers a series of predictions that we bring to the data. The first is a prediction about firm level lobbying in general, and that is that you should see that only large firms should be politically organized, should lobby at all, and among them, the larger lobbying firms should spend more and should lobby more. Then, specifically to trade agreements, you know, 
the, the implications are similar. You should only see large companies lobbying on trade agreements and the larger companies should spend more lobbying on the content of trade agreements. And when you look at the text of trade agreement, or also if you were to look at the text of domestic trade agreements, you should see that the content, the provisions included, are influenced, are shaped by the lobbying effort of these large companies. So in terms of data, what we do is use data on lobbying reports, which is something that a lot of this recent literature, including work by Anna Maria, one of our other discussants, has, has used. Compared to the, the data used in earlier empirical studies of lobbying, uh, which were using data on campaign contribution, there are two main advantages of using data on expenditures, lobbying expenditures. The first and most important is that you can actually trace the issues targeted by the lobbyists. As you'll see when I, you know, you already hinted at the report where a firm will say, I'm lobbying on TPP intellectual property. This is the kind of information you could never get with campaign contributions. Also, lobbying expenditure are the most important channel of political influence. In fact, if you compare total lobbying expenditure on all issues and total PAC contributions, you see the lobbying expenditures are more than 10 times larger. So what the, the, this data on lobby reports has become available thanks to the Lobby Disclosure Act that was passed in 1995 in the US, which requires any lobbyists, individuals and organizations to file semi-annual reports in which they provide a lot of information about their lobbying activities. I don't have the time, unfortunately, to go into details, but basically you'll see some example of reports that will, you know, will illustrate the kind of rich information you have. Uh, what Insong at MIT has done is to organize the universe of lobby reports in a very tractable way. So you can search by topic, uh, you can so search, sorry, I have a request or something. You can search by topic and you can also search, which is key for us, by firm. So let me, I'm somehow unable to move. Now I've accepted Roberta something. I've accepted a request and now I don't move. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can still hear you. Fine. Yes. I, I cannot move anymore. Somehow Roberta Pier Martini has requested something and now I cannot do anything anymore. I don't know why. What's happening? My screen is frozen. Which is here. Brian can help us. Let me stop my share. Okay. Sorry, my, uh, I don't know what to do. This is weird. Let me stop sharing and start again. Uh, I don't know. Let's That's see. a good idea. Uh, share. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Can I'm not going to accept anything from Roberta anymore. Let me start. Again. Okay. <laughs> so what you get from Lobby View is the universe of lobby reports. And what we can easily do is extract the lobby reports file by firms because we have unique identifiers for all publicly listed firms. So what we have is first a data set that has all lobbying firms on all issues, firms are lobbying on any issue that are listed in the US. And we have more than 300,000 reports filed by more than 4,000 firms. The top lobbying firms that spend the most are these ones, the top 20. You can basically see all the firms, the usual suspects. You can see, for example, the most the most active lobbyist is actually General Electric, which in the 99-2020 period has spent more than $7 billion, has filed almost 8,000 lobby reports, and has lobbied of the 79 uh, broad LDA issues, has lobbied on 59 of them. And as you can see here, you have Ford, Boeing, General Motors, AT&T, Google, Pfizer and Bayer, so the big pharmaceutical, Microsoft, so these are big, big companies that are the most active at lobbying in general. We can uh, construct various lobbying measures, how much they spend lobbying, how many reports, as you just saw. And we can also see, uh, we can use CompuStat, which is merged with LobbyView, to get all the characteristics in terms of sales, employment, so the size of the firm and which sector they operate in. Then we extract a smaller data set, which is the, all the lobbying reports related to trade agreements. And this is extending our previous work with Mike and Mathieu, in which we were looking at lobbying reports filed during the ratification of trade agreements, because in that paper we were interested in political economy of trade agreements as agreements that simply liberalize trade between trading partners, so eliminate tariffs. Here we are interested in 
lobbying on the content of trade agreements. So we're actually interested in the negotiation part where firms, when they lobby, can still shape the content of trade agreements. But we have actually collected all reports and there are uh, over 2,500 reports filed by 224 firms on the 12 agreements that the US has negotiated and ratified since the Lobbying Disclosure Act was passed. Let me give you a couple of examples of reports very quickly. This is a report filed by BP. It's an old example of an old report pre-2008 where they were non-digitalized. You see the filing is covering the period first semester of 2007. This is the amount spent, two million and you know, over $2 million. And in section 15 and 16, you see what are the general issues, which in this case is trade, and what are the specific issues? And as you see here, among the specific issues, there is support of US Colombia FTA. And this was in 2007 when this agreement was being negotiated. So, this is one of the 2,551 reports that are in our data set on lobbying on trade agreements. And what we have, you can then construct measures at the firm agreement level. For example, how much a firm spends lobbying on a particular trade agreement A or how many reports a firm spends logging on a particular trade agreement. What we then need for the purpose of you know, addressing the question, does lobbying affect the content of trade agreement? We then use the measures, the, the data set constructed by uh, the World Bank Group, the new data set that allows us to measure that at the agreement issue level for 17 policy issues for which experts have designed this questionnaire issue specific. And then we can measure basically the coverage of these, uh, of each of the 17 issue in each of the agreements that the US has negotiated. And as you can see, there is variation. This is across all US FTAs. You see that some issues are, you know, have higher, you know, higher debt than others. And uh, what we want to do is, of course, look at how important these issues are for the firms that are lobbying on trade agreements. And so the way we do that is to take all firms that are in a lobbying on FTA data set. And we collect all lobbying reports that these firms have filed and then look at all the issues that they mention in their section 16. So again, like, let me give you an example. This is Novartis. Novartis is one of the firms that lobbies on FTAs. And Novartis, in one of the many reports it files, says that he's spending over a million dollars lobbying on what? Sorry, lobbying on trade, but in particular, intellectual property and in particular trade agreements. Another one is Intel that tells you I'm lobbying on trade competition. So you see the way we do it is basically to, for these 17 policy issues, we count how often the firms that lobby on trade agreements mention the policy issues as related to trade. So what we then have, as I mentioned, uh, or as a, we can construct a measure of lobbying effort at the agreement issue level, the same variation of the debt measure we have, which is combining information on the effort firms make lobbying on a particular trade agreement A, so in terms of expenditure number of reports, combined with the importance of the particular policy issue for the lobbying firm. Okay, let me get to the results. So we have three main predictions so far, and so three main, the analysis, empirical analysis divided in three parts. The first is just about lobbying in general, so what we should see is selection into lobbying by uh, the largest firms. So we are looking at all firms listed in the US and looking at the probability that the firm is organized using a probit model. And as you can see, size matters as you expect. So it's the largest firms, the lobby, and you know, whether you do it with size or you know, in terms of employment or sales, you know, the probability of lobby is still increasing in size. You can also see this. This is combining the intensive and extensive margin because, as you see, here is the number of LDA issues that are up to 79 that these firms lobby on. Firms that are small in terms of safety or employment don't lobby on any issue. They are just not politically organized. And as you go to larger firms, you have, you know, they clearly lobby on more issues. And you can see it also here where we just do a scatter plot of, you know, sales against number of issues lobbied or. Uh, lobbying expenditure in general, or you can do it with proper regression where you can put various fixed effects, and you see that clearly uh, there's support for the first prediction, i.e. it is only the largest companies uh, that actually are politically active, and among the lobbying firms, the largest among them lobby on more issues and spend more money. 
so this is, you know, as a model we suggest, if you're larger, you have a larger product scope, you're going to be, have incentive to pay the fixed cost of lobbying. And the larger is your product scope, the more provision you want to try to affect. So the more policy issues you're trying to lobby. Uh, then we move to lobbying specifically on FTAs. And what we show, again, in line with the second prediction, that it is only the largest companies that are lobbying on FTAs. And in fact, you can see that even from the descriptive statistics. So the average size of firms in a lobbying on FTA's data set is 77,000 employees. And the maximum, I can show you the descriptive statistics if there's time later, is almost 2 million. That's Walmart. So these are really large companies, much larger than the average lobbying company. There are active lobbying on FTA's. The probability of lobbying is very low, so less than 1% of firms in companies that lobbying on trade agreements, but these companies are really large. And among these companies, the lobbying on trade agreements, the larger spend more, as you can see here. Finally, and I'm almost on time, this is where we want to check if Danny Roddick was right. So we want to now relate the depth of the trade agreement measure with the new World Bank data set, which allows us to say, in this particular agreement, US, Singapore, US, you know, all these trade agreements that we have, there's 12 of them that have been negotiated and ratified, you know, and we look at the 17 issues that are for which we can measure that. So do we see that the coverage of this issue in this particular trade agreement depends on the lobbying effort done by firms on that trade agreement which care about this about this issue? And we are gonna use the two measures of lobbying effort constructed by interacting the, the, the measure that captures the importance of the lobbying issue I for the firms and either lobbying effort one, lobbying expenditures on a particular trade agreement or number of lobbying effort. That's the second measure. And we use different fixed effects, either only FDA or only issue fixed effects or both. And as you can see, beyond the anecdotal evidence that you already see when you look at these lobbying reports where firms tell you I am lobbying on these provisions, on this agreement, but you can see that the actual text of the agreement that has been measured with this uh, fantastic World Bank effort to really measure the provision contained in these trade agreements reflects the lobbying effort of these large companies that are actively lobbying. And I should say, these are really, we have constructed this measure using only lobby reports filed during the negotiations where, since you are before signature, you can shape the content of trade agreement. Once you, uh, the agreement is signed, this is, you know, there's no amendment possible. So this is, you know, I was actually surprised that it worked so well. And it worked, let me finish here, this is just a summary. Uh, you know, let me maybe go through it. I mean, this is very preliminary, like all the papers presented, I guess, in this webinar series. But we are quite excited. We are trying to, what we are trying to do is develop a new theoretical framework uh, that is simple and tractable and can be extended in several dimensions to study lobbying on multiple policy issues and where we have firm heterogeneity, which is clearly there in the data. It's really a few large companies that are active lobbying in general and particular on trade agreements. And indeed, we are cons constructing this new firm level data set we find in line with the model that lobbying is dominated by large companies and, and also the text of trade agreements seems to reflect the, the lobbying effort of these companies. We have lots of work to do, of course, so this is the first goal. So one of the things we need to do is clean our data set. There are, we have been searching through this enormous data set of lobbying reports. We use often keywords or bill numbers to find lobby reports related to particular trade agreements or particular policy issues. And you get sometimes false negative and false positive, which we have been cleaning, but we need, you know, we are going through new, better algorithms to further clean the data to minimize measurement error. And we are going to extend the analysis to TPP. The reason we haven't done so yet is the TPP, the, if you look at the World Bank coding of TPP, this is the TPP without the US which is actually, as I mentioned earlier, different because various provisions were changed. But we are going to include TPP. This is something that you know, we are working on. And we are going to also enrich the model. We have started doing that. We have actually a series of new predictions that we started looking at. Uh, and I'm going to have more, you know, I hopefully get more suggestions on which direction we want to further extend our analysis. So thank you. Stop. Are you there? 
Yep, thank you, Paula. <laughs> and thanks for, for coming in on time. Um, okay, we have a question from James. Uh, he would like to ask a question. James, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, thanks. Let me you. Hi, Paula, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I'm trying to see you. Where are you? I'm trying to see the face. <laughs> I enjoyed your presentation. So I have a quick question on the last regression that you presented, where you've got yeah. uh, lobbying effort on the right hand side and depth on the left hand side. So I'm a little bit confused how to interpret this coefficient in the sense that when a firm is lobbying more, presumably it's because there's resistance that it needs to overcome from um, entities or groups that would um, like to see depth lower. Um, so maybe that resistance is in the form of campaign contributions taken there smaller, but the marginal value of campaign contributions might be much larger politically. Maybe it's lobbying that's um, by another group that this firm is overcoming. Maybe it's some other. Um, yeah, no, I can't think it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because of this, because if they're lobbying more, it's because presumably they need to overcome greater resistance. And then if there's more lobbying by the firm that you're observing, as well as increased resistance from another group in the economy, then theoretically, it's not obvious that you should then see increased depth in favour of the, the way The way we model it uh, is to, you know, here is to look at, you know, you have a bill, this can be an FDA bill or it can be a domestic bill. And what firms are trying to do is to really put in this bill a provision that really, the way it's modeled now, only affects you. And, and, uh, and in fact, if you look at, we, we provide some example, I added yesterday a long footnote with examples of provision that firms put in a bill where there's only, the, the only firm lobbying on that provision, on that bill is really the only firm. Like this is audiovisual, this is like a company that is making that product and you're giving a subsidy to that particular product that you are the only uh, producer of or tariff suspension bill where you're saying, I would like to suspend this particular tariff line that you really ends up being just you. So in a way we are now modeling not something that where you will have uh, uh, opposition to by other firms they care, but you are the only, if you put effort, you can include, you know, include something that is going to be favorable to you without having any you know, spillovers on other companies. We can, of course, and that's one of the directions where we can extend the analysis, assume that the provisions have you know, effects on other firms in the same sector in the economy, and then you would expect indeed some opposition. Right now in the simple model, what we are doing is to simply say, I can carve out in this bill a provision that is really my favorite you know, IPR, TPT, or whatever provision that is going to be favorable to me. And, and the only thing is, if I don't do anything, nobody's going to put me up. So that's the simple way we've modeled it so far, where there is no problem of what are the firms or, you know, may, you know, the only thing is that if you don't, uh, push for it, nobody is going to include that provision. But, you know, we can definitely, from this very simple you know, first version, we can actually start thinking about what will happen if, you know, if you, there are other firms who may benefit from the state provision. Say you're lobbying for tightening of IPR provision in a trade agreement, like, uh, you know, the strengthening of patent protection, maybe fights, but also buyer are going to all benefit. And so there could be collaboration between lobbies or there could be conflict. Between lobbies. Right now, we started from the simplest possible model where the firm lobby for provisions that are specific to its product and you know it's their firm product specific so the issue you're raising doesn't arise but empirically provisions are intellectual property competition policy or they're much more specific as you were just explaining now in the empirical exercise so there are many here you know that we i think we don't have much time to enter into that if you look at the handbook uh, that the world bank has you know where it describes a new data, so every, there's been experts for each issue where they have designed questions and they're issue specific. With a lot of questions for some issues, there's disparity. So there, I think 137 or for IPR and, you know, the number difference, but they're very detailed, yes or no questions for each issue. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll send you if you want the handbook, you can look at very detailed and you can basically, uh, you can measure much better than earlier data set. 
issue debt, you know, or debt at the issue agreement level. Before it was more extensive margin, is, is an issue covered or not? Now you can see the extent to which an issue is covered, a bit along the lines of what Rodrigo was saying. Is it one third of a page on IPR or is it 23 pages plus two annexes? So there's more intensive margin, margin variation on the coverage. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paula, and thanks, James. Um, I think in the end we're going to need to move to the next uh, presentation. So thank you, Paula. So the next presentation is going to be the value of deep trade agreements in the presence of pricing to market. Um, and I'm not sure who's going to be presenting this one. Uh, Mer Meredith. Okay. I am. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, um, so thanks very much for having us here today and thanks for organizing um, this conference and giving us this great new data. So the paper I'm presenting is called The Value of Deep Trade Agreements in the Presence of Pricing to Market and it's joint work with Lou Han at the University of Liverpool and Thomas Prayer, who's a PhD student at Cambridge. So as background, I'll just say that a previous work that Lou and I have done with Giancarlo Corsetti has focused on the universe of international trade transactions for the UK and China. And we found that firms that export to multiple destinations employ different pricing strategies. And in particular, we're interested in those papers and the extent of pricing to market. And we see the pricing to market behavior by firms is correlated with observables and is generally more prevalent when we're looking at highly differentiated products, when we look at consumer versus intermediate goods, when we look at goods that are exported by foreign invested enterprises in China, or when we look at goods that are invoiced in the local currency of a destination in the case of the UK. So with that, as background, our question in this paper is, do preferential trade agreements lead to greater market integration, more intense competition, and less market power for exporting firms? And our specific approach in this paper, which is empirical, is we're gonna look at product level exports for about 640,000 firms located in 13 low and middle income countries going to 165 different destinations that provide um, import tariff and PTA participation data. With this data set, we're gonna look at 257 trade agreements in the World Bank's Deep Trade Agreements database to evaluate how third country competitive pressures, which are measured as PTA participation as well as preferential tariffs, as well as specific bilateral provisions in these trade agreements impact firm level export sales, firm level prices, and destination specific markups charged by firms. Sorry, I'm going backwards there. Um, in 20 minutes, I can't summarize the literature. I'll just say we contribute to three different literatures. Um, importantly, we're gonna start from a Baron Bergstrand 2007 structural gravity equation, and we'll build in some third country competition effects along the lines of Bowne and Crowley 2007. So getting to the data. So we've got a very large data set here. Um, a shout out to Anna Fernandez, who gave us the World Bank Exporter Dynamics Database for 11 of the countries in our sample. Uh, the map in front of you highlights in red the 13 countries that we're going to be looking at in this paper. Um, in addition to the 11 countries from the Exporter Dynamics Database, we've added data for Egypt and for China. Um, the, the time spans vary for the different um, individual countries, but generally about 91% of our observations come from between 2000 and 2009, 98% of the observations we have altogether come from the period between 2000 and 2012. So what do we do? We have um, this large data set of 27.5 million firm, product, origin, destination, and year quintuplets or observations, and we're interested in studying how these firms respond to trade policy as well as to trade policy that their competitors in particular destination markets face. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a sense of our data, um, for example, Albania, um, for Albania, 11% of Albanian export observations are to destinations with which Albania has its own PTA. 
but three quarters of Albania's export observations are to destinations in which at least one of Albania's competitor has a PTA with the destination. And similarly, if we think about Mexico, 60 to 70% of Mexican observations, depending on the year, are to a country with which Mexico has a PTA, but 80% of Mexican export observations are to destinations in which at least one of Mexico's competitor countries has a PTA with that destination. Now, in terms of our empirical approach, we start with a classical Baron Bergstrand 2007 structural gravity equation applied to firm and product level data. So what do we have here? The dependent variable is the value of firm level trade from an origin to a destination at the level of a six digit product annually. And we're gonna regress this on a dummy for PTA, but it will also include in line with the structural gravity literature, a firm origin product year fixed effect to capture firm and origin specific time variation at the level of the product. We'll also include a destination product year fixed effect to control for multilateral resistance in the destination, general changes in the conditions of competition in that product market. And then we'll include um, origin destination fixed effects. Now, this is the starting point. Our first innovation is we're gonna introduce a measure to capture the share of country O's competitors that have a PTA with destination D. So how do we do that? Here's a graphic. In this figure, the blue circle at the bottom represents our origin country. It is exporting to the red circle in the middle, which is the destination. There are five other countries that are exporting in a specific six digit HS product market to this destination. Three of the countries have a PTA with the destination, two do not. So what we do is using import data from Comtrade from 250 countries, we are going to construct the six digit HS level import weighted share of the origins competitors in the destination that have a PTA with the destination. So in this example, six tenths of the competitors trade weighted have a PTA with the destination. This variable will range from zero if no competitors have a PTA to one if they all have a PTA. Um, this is a computationally intensive variable to construct. Um, Thomas tells me that using a 16 core server um, with code running in parallel, it takes a couple of days to construct sort of this variable um, because we're constructing this competition variable for every origin to a destination. Now, once we've done that, we're also going to expand the specification. We want to also include bilateral tariffs between the origin and the destination, the product. And then we're going to, in a similar way to the last variable, we're going to construct the average tariff facing country O's competitors in destination D for product I. Then we will add on to each specification information on the specific detailed PTA provisions in the Deep Trade Agreements database. So the analysis and the way we look at these provisions can be applied to any binary provision in the DTA database. Today, we're just going to look at four, okay? Um, and in the interest of time, you know, we construct the import weighted average tariff for each product I, um, each product I of the competitors of origin O um, just by trade weighting. So, sorry, skipping ahead too quickly. Okay, in terms of our findings, um, the direct effects of PTAs are unsurprising at the level of the firm when a origin and destination have a PTA, the average export sales of a firm is 40 to 52% higher. Um, we also observe that uh, prices of the origin to the destination are two to 5% lower. Markups are about 4% lower. So generally it looks like PTAs have pro-competitive effects. Now, more interestingly, what we've got in this paper is an approach to capturing these third country PTA effects. So for example, we observe that when 10% of an origin's competitors in the destination have a PTA, the origin's exports are gonna be about 10% lower. 
Similarly, if we want to look at um, third country effects of tariffs, if we raise the tar average tariff against an origin's competitors in a destination by 1%, prices of that good from the origin are going to go up by 4 tenths to 8 tenths of a percent. And similarly, if we want to just restrict our attention to highly differentiated goods, so automobiles, cell phones, um, you know, units, basically anything that is an intact object, um, when the tariff against an origin's competitors in a destination go up 1%, the markups from the origin rise 1.4%. So in a little bit more detail, here are baseline results from just looking at PTAs and competitor PTAs. So as I just said, um, if you focus your attention on the second column, if the origin and destination have a PTA, average exports from the origin are higher. If 10% uh, of an origin's competitors in a destination have a PTA, average exports from the origin are about 10% lower. And if you focus in on the pink highlighted number, if we increase the average tariff against competitors in a destination by about 1%, we observe the origin's average exports are 4.8% higher. Now, importantly, I should point out that in column two, you'll note that we did not include an origin destination fixed effect, okay? So what that means is that the PTA effect and the other variables are identified off time variation within a bilateral pair associated with the, the PTA variable switching on, as well as cross-sectional variation between bilateral pairs that do or do not have uh, PTAs. Now, why are we leaving out the origin destination fixed effect? So the focus of our analysis on product level exports of firms, and these empirically we know have an extremely active extensive margin. So if we omit the bilateral pair fixed effect, we can get some identification of the variables of, of the parameters of interest from variation in both the intensive and extensive margin of product level trade by firms. So entry or exit by firms at the product level into a particular destination are gonna to contribute to the estimated effect. Now, if you turn to column three, you know, obviously the, the weakness there is that we're not controlling for standard gravity variables such as language and distance. So once we include in this firm level data set, these um, control for origin destination fixed effects, we estimate the direct effect of the PTA as a small negative effect on trade. Now, including the fixed effect is somewhat unsatisfactory because we're losing that extensive mar var uh, margin variation, um, but including it, excluding it's also somewhat unsatisfactory because we are identifying the variable off cross-sectional rather than intertemporal variation. So there's pros and cons of each. But a takeaway from this picture in column three is that even if we put in origin destination fixed effects, we still find important third country competition. So if 10% of an origin's competitors have a PTA, we still estimate the origin's exports are three and a half percent lower we still see an increase in the tariff facing an origin's competitors in destination is associated with the origin exporting more. Now, the focus of our talk was supposed to be on prices and markups. What do we do with those? So within um, the 13 countries we're looking at, origin countries, we construct the unit values at the level of a firm origin destination product in time. And then we're going to regress it on a specification very similar to the gravity model I showed you earlier. In all specifications, we're going to include this blue fixed effect. That's the destination product time fixed effect, which should capture multilateral, multilateral resistance within the destination at the level of the product. And then we'll use um, different sets of fixed effects to try to get at different ideas. First of all, we can include um, the first set would be these red fixed effects. In this, we're holding, we're putting in a firm fixed effect to control for things like firm size, firm time and variant productivity, firm market power, as well as origin product time fixed effects um, that should capture things like wage fluctuations within origin. We can also put in um, origin destination fixed effects because we know that um, for things like the Alchian Allen effect, 
if we increase the distance, we're going to get higher, you know, we see higher quality in some um, data sets. And then finally, we can just put in a fixed effect for the firm, origin country, product, and time. This is going to control for time varying changes in productivity or marginal cost at the level of a product within a firm. And the residual variation in the unit value is essentially a destination specific markup. And so we'll see how that particular uh, aspect of the data changes. What do we see? Generally, if you look across the top row here, if an origin and a destination have a PTA, average prices from the origin are lower. If an origin and destination have a PTA, the average markup from the origin is lower. And in specification five, when we include origin and destination fixed effects to control for distance, language, et cetera, what we observe is that higher tariffs both against oneself and against one's competitors in the destination are associated with higher prices. It's also the case that if we restrict our attention to a sample of highly differentiated goods, we will also observe that prices and markups are very responsive. They increase in one's own as well as one's competitor's tariffs. Now, provisions. Um, this is the benefit of the deep trade agreement database. There's lots of provisions in the database. We're going to focus on four and use sort of two distinct applications to illustrate the methodology. So we can think about provisions regarding how a firm that wants to take advantage of a preferential tariff documents that it meets the PTA's rules of origin. Some PTAs allow an exporting firm to self-certify that its merchandise satisfies the origin requirements of the PTA. I think about this as the, the easy or lower cost option. Other agreements require a government or government authorized approved authority provide the documentation that certifies origin. So we can think about that as more costly. It's an either or type of situation. PTA either self certifies or requires government certification. On the other hand, we have provisions like mutual recognition. Um, mutual recognition, we have a PTA. If it includes mutual recognition of standards, that means origin firms can export merchandise satisfying origin standards to the destination. And if a PTA includes mutual recognition of conformity assessment, Origin firms can use a local testing facility within their own country to document that their merchandise complies with any standards that are set in the destination. These are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, all of the agreements um, that allow for conformity assessment also, or I'm sorry, all the agreements that allow for mutual recognition of standards also allow for uh, mutual recognition of conformity assessment. So there's less variation there. So what do we see when we do an experiment? We estimate these models and we do an experiment. We compare what the trade impact is going to be under a PTA, which allows for self-certification of rules of origin versus a PTA in which the government must provide certification of rules of origin. So the first thing, if your PTA allows self-certification, there's a big bump in trade value. We also observe that those origin firms are charging higher prices, just a little bit higher and slightly higher markups. Now, if instead we have a PTA in which the government is required to provide certification of rules of origin, there's still a positive impact on trade and it's quite substantial, but it's notably lower than when we have self-certification of rules of origin. It's also the case that with this type of setup, we've got small reductions in prices and markups. Now, most interestingly, from my point of view, is what happens when we have third country competition. If I'm an origin and 10% of my competitors in a destination have a PTA in which those competitors can self-certify that they've met their PTA's rules of origins, this has a strong negative impact on my exports to the destination. It also tends to have a slight uh, adapt, provide some slight downward pressure on my prices and markups. And so the interesting thing here is that this deeper provision that sort of facilitates a lot of trade between the origin and destination also has a sort of negative externality or harm on outsiders to the trade agreement. In contrast, if sorry, if we look at the last row of this table, 
The experiment there is we give 10% of an origin's competitors in a destination a PTA, but those firms, if they want to get preferential tariffs, they have to use the government certification route. In that case, if I'm the origin country, it has no impact, no measurable impact on my trade volume, and it has no measurable impact on the prices or markups I charge. So this is quite interesting, I think. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is mutual recognition pro, uh, provisions in a PTA. Um, very briefly, we have very few uh, provisions about mutual recognition within the PTAs in the Dream Trade Agreements database. There's only 10 for mutual recognition of standards. There's 16 for mutual recognition of conformity assessment. So there's very little variation, and that comes out when we do the estimates. Both mutual recognition of standards and mutual recognition of conformity assessment are associated with huge, much, much higher vol uh, values of trade between the origin and the destination and some slight reductions in prices. Now, in contrast to what we saw when we were looking at rules of origin provisions, here, the direction of the impact of third country competition is the opposite. So if I'm an origin, and 10% of my competitors have a PTA with the destination that allows either mutual recognition of standards or mutual recognition of conformity assessment, my exports from the origin are about 25 or 30% higher. Further, I have slightly higher prices and slightly higher markups relative to my competitors not having this PTA. So the, why is this going on or what's happening here? Um, it's not entirely clear, but perhaps one of the, the things here is this type of provision in the PTA captures a sort of maybe simpler or more transparent regulatory environment within the destination that has benefits not just limited to the countries that have the PTA, but maybe the, the more simple regulatory regime is just extending sort of the benefits of trade to more countries. So in wrapping up, um, our contribution here is to develop a new approach for examining not only the direct, but also the indirect third country effects of PTAs and their provisions. And I think one of the most important things we've got here is we see that when we have deeper trade agreements that are characterized by more intense trade among members, the impacts that they have on third countries can depend on precisely what types of provisions they include. So for a provision like self-certification, that's a simplification bilaterally that's only available to the trade agreement members, that type of deep provision is actually harming trade from non-members. In contrast, for something like mutual recognition, what we're seeing is that the third country impact is positive, and this is perhaps suggestive that provisions that broadly simplify the economic environment may have non-exclusive benefits that are open to non-participants in the trade agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I see we have a question from Jeffrey. Jeffrey, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, get the video on. Oh, um, so first of all, Meredith, uh, thanks very much. Great, great presentation. Uh, as you know, I, I'm the one of the discussants on it, and I'll send a, uh, a bunch of comments later. Uh, but just thought I'd ask uh, one question. Um, and uh, and it's fascinating the take during the presentation about the role of the competitor's uh, influence, which was really, really well done. Uh, just a quick question, and, and uh, on the specification, you brought it up yourself, the tension whether or not to have the origin destination fixed effects in there and, and the trade-offs that you face. I was just wondering, maybe it's something to think about as a, uh, perhaps a robustness, because I know uh, by introducing those, you lose a lot of the firms and the uh, uh, the large number of um, firms that you have. That uh, firm sample size is very important. But could you possibly uh, aggregate a little bit up uh, in terms of the uh, the dependent variable to kind of capture an extensive margin, something like in a Hummel's cleanout way? Um, so you could, even in the presence of those uh, bilateral fixed effects, uh, to be able to extract both an extensive and intensive margin uh, if you aggregate up a little bit. So um, maybe you have a thought on that. Uh. Um, that's, that's a good suggestion. I think this is one of the things 
where we've been a little bit, this is just sort of just the first pass. And so I think that's actually a very useful thing we could do. I think there's differences whether or not we can certainly aggregate if we want to look at the values. And that might help us get tight more tightly in line with the literature, which is really focused on on product level flows and there's much less of an entry exit dynamic um, at the firm level. For looking at prices and markups, we're, we need to stay with the disaggregated stuff, but um, that's actually a very useful suggestion um, that we can take a look at. Okay. So All right. I'll pass it. on uh, other comments later. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So we have a couple minutes. I think, James, you have a question here. Meredith, really interesting Thanks. paper. Thanks. So I'm thinking about the recent results in the empirical trade war literature in terms of the full pass through of tariffs to prices. I'm yeah. wondering, so you're not finding a similar result. Of course, you're talking about tariff cuts, but still the, there wasn't full pass through. So I'm wondering about if you have any thoughts about how the empirical setting or setup you've got there relates to that literature about full pass through of trade war tariffs to prices. Yeah, so I think, I guess, um, so one of the things we have here is we actually have, when we're looking at markups, for some of our samples, the markup is responding more than 100% to the change in the tariff um, when we're looking at competition effects. And I think that this is in line, so I guess when we, when we think about these pass through of the trade war effects, in some sense that data is looking at prices at the dock in the US and it's looking at sort of an average price at different points in time, but it's not using the firm level prices. So I think one aspect here is we're looking at the exporter price and we're looking at variation in exporters prices across destinations. And we know from some of our other work that the firm markup over marginal cost varies across the different markets it's selling to. And so we see that when we look at uh, markups in response to exchange rate fluctuations um, as well as in tariffs, and that's in some other work. So I guess I'm, I'm still thinking that the empirical results on the U.S. trade war seem to be somewhat specific to that one event because that, that pass through that we see then between the U.S. and China seems to be a little bit more like a one-off, and I'm not sure entirely why. If we're looking at how the price from the exporter responds to exchange rate movements, or in this case, we're looking at how they respond to changes in the tariffs. Um, we're seeing more variation in response to the types of goods. So um, we see that the markups, I think even here, are more responsive when we look at the highly differentiated goods, and those are the ones where we would expect more pricing to market. So I think maybe some of it has to do with looking at prices coming out of firms at the exporter's dock versus looking at average prices at the importer's dock that are aggregated across a bunch of firms. So maybe there's something funny going on there, but also I'm, I'm, you know, the U.S. results are surprising and it's still a little bit of a puzzle to me. Okay, we have one minute left and I think Anna has a question. Uh, okay, uh, hi Meredith, thanks a lot for the paper, very interesting. A uh, quick question I, to clarify the sample you used. Uh, did you focus just on positive export flows or you added zeros in some dimension? No, so we only, we only have an observation if the trade flow is positive. So partly the data set's so big with, you know, 27. So we haven't done any of the introduced the zeros before and after each firm enters the market. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Really interesting. Um, okay. We now turn to the third and final paper, which is designing preferential liberalization. And Matteo, I guess, is going to present. Uh, Matteo, we don't hear you. Can you hear me? 
Now we can hear you, yes. Excellent. Do you see my slides? Yes, we do. Splendid. Thanks a lot. Uh, so this is a, um, a study titled Global Value Chains and Deep Integration. Um, is a, a preliminary work with uh, Leo Baccini at McGill, Bernard Huckman at EUI, Carlo Altamonte and uh, Italo Colantone from Bocconi University. Um, sorry, great. So uh, in order to position our uh, tell you a bit about um, our reading on um, on the literature on, on PTA design. So uh, the fact is that PTAs uh, are characterized by complex and multidimensional design uh, and then the data collection effort by the World Bank is, a, is, a, uh, is, is proving that very much with, with coding 17 chapters and, and a, a huge number of provisions. Um, the, when we, when we reflect on the drivers of, uh, of this uh, complex and multidimensional design and, and PTAs, uh, we have a number of theories from economists and, and uh, international political economy scholars that suggest that uh, offshoring, vertical FDI, the activities of multinational enterprises, and in one word, uh, uh, global value chains activities are important drivers of, of deep integration. Um, however, when we when we look at, at what the of conference uh, uh, the, the, the bias is, is toward uh, estimating the causal effect of uh, this new uh, complex and multidimensional design of PTAs. And actually previous studies on the drivers uh, of, this, of this design uh, um, leave us with, with mostly uh, uh, correlations uh, estimated between uh, global value chains related variables and, and depth. And so the, the, the plan of this, of this research is actually to fill this gap and, uh, and to, and to uh, study the, the causal effect of global value chains related variables on, on PTA's design by combining uh, a new identification strategy based on excludable instrument for trade and, and global value chains variables with the with the new uh, with new data on on PTA design, so the the background research question here is the effect of the design of PTAs, and and in particular, what we do in this paper is we use a this this novel identification strategy to estimate the causal effect of growth and and value added trade, and and we take value added trade as as aggregate country uh, country sector level uh, proxies of global value chains activities on uh, three things. First, uh, a comprehensive, uh, uh, although synthetic indicator of, of the depth uh, of uh, PTAs. Uh, second, we, we, we want to unpack this, this, uh, this uh, uh, synthetic indicator and we look at indicators which are function of uh, chapters including uh, included in PTAs, and we will look at dispute settlement, services investment, and uh, state-owned enterprise chapters. But again, we, we're not we're not satisfied because chapters can actually mean mean many different things in terms of uh, deepening uh, liberalization, and we we actually take advantage of, uh, and look at the provisional level. Of, of the design of uh, PTAs, uh, and there we are really able to capture what in those in the design of these PTAs is is overlapping with the with the multilateral regime provided by the WTO, and we will look at a number of uh, WTO same provisions. What instead is is taking policy issues uh, uh, discipline in the WTO and 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 pushing them farther, expanding their um, their uh, their scope, the WTO plus type of provision. And, and we can also look at those provisions that that um, that determine an extension of, of the coverage uh, of the of the WTO by by complementing the WTO regime with with policy issues which are which are not which are not addressed in the in the multi multilateral WTO regime. Um, we will work with a uh, with an empirical framework consisting on four on of forty countries up to thirty five sectors. Uh, a limited period uh, between 1995 and 2007, and I will tell you more about this this uh, this constraints on on our 
um, on on the on the uh, time uh, time period of our empirical um, uh, sample, and uh, the main result of our research is that actually global value chains trade, and in particular the foreign value added content of gross exports, increases depth of PTAs, uh, uh, and more precisely the probability of signing agreements that go beyond the WTO. So we. We, we really capture the, the quality of the, of the uh, liberalization with response to uh, global value chains uh, uh, activities. So um, we uh, contribute to two main uh, strands of the literature. On the one hand, we, uh, we complement those studies that look at the effects of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the design of uh, PTAs. Our and variables. Um, and on the other hand, we were also complementing the literature that looks at the trade policy effect of uh, global value chains uh, uh, activities, such as offshoring, FDI, and, and general activities of multinational enterprises. And we, we are um, one of the first study that actually looks at uh, uh, the, the design of PTAs as, as an outcome variable responding to global value chains, um, global value chains phenomena. Uh, let me, before jumping into the empirics, which is the core of our contribution, let me tell you something about uh, what we think in terms of why global value chains uh, uh, can actually be the drivers of PTA design. So it's, it's our thinking uh, motivated by our reading of, of, of existing literature. And so much of this will, will resonate with, with what Paula just, just presented uh, <clears throat> half an hour ago. Um, again, let, let us start from the premise that uh, the, this, uh, this complex and multidimensional design of PTAs uh, has the potential to, to, uh, uh, to transform PTAs in policy instruments that can extend and complement the, the, the WTO regime in reducing barriers for trading intermediates, uh, covering uh, novel issues uh, in terms of investment services, liberalization, uh, dispute settlement, and, and the discipline of state-owned enterprises. And all these things we know from, from the existing literature and theories are uh, pretty appealing for multinational enterprises entering and competing in foreign markets and involved in intra-firm trade. And, and these are the, the, the micro phenomena behind the, the value added trade that, that we will use in our empirical framework. Now, we also know, uh, and, and uh, Paula's, uh, uh, Paula's presentation uh, at the beginning uh, confirms that, that multinational enterprises are involved uh, global production, they, they do a, a good deal of, uh, of uh, uh, lobbying activities in, in, in favor of preferential liberalization, and, and they generally tend to outspend import competing uh, interests uh, in, uh, in um, determining the, the final trade policy um, decided by governments. Uh, therefore, our our conclusion is that we we should we should expect countries uh, uh, relatively more involved in trade through global value chains to have higher incentives uh, to form uh, uh, deep PTAs in the sense of uh, PTAs that can actually uh, provide uh, multinational enterprises with, with policy tools which, which go beyond uh, the, the, existing, uh, the existing policy regime. <clears throat> now, the empirics. Uh, let, me, let me present the, the treatments that we will uh, use in our, uh, the, um, in our um, empirical exercise. Uh, variables uh, on the right side. And the first one is, is a proxy for trade, is a standard uh, measure of gross exports from an origin I to a destination J, uh, and it, it will have a sectoral dimension Z, and it will be observed uh, over time. And then we will follow the, the NBR uh, paper by Wang and co-authors uh, to decompose a sector, uh, sectoral uh, gross exports into uh, different components and, and form two uh, aggregates, one that we call domestic value, which will be a, a measure of the <clears throat> domestic value added embedded in, in gross exports, and a second one, uh, which we call a foreign value or vertical specialization, which will be a proxy for the foreign value added embedded in the exports uh, from country I to country J. Again, all these variables will have a sectoral dimension. The source of these three um, uh, treatments uh, is uh, the Wyatt database, the 2013 uh, uh, vintage, 
covering 40 countries and, and 35 sectors. Now, the outcome variables, um, these will be indicators of uh, uh, PTA's design um, between two signatures, I and J, active at time T. The first one will be this uh, synthetic uh, continuous indicator of depth, uh, which comes from uh, uh, DESTA, <clears throat> and it's constructed through a latent trade analysis, uh, um, aggregating almost 50 uh, uh, individual uh, variables. Uh, a counterpart uh, of, of this uh, synthetic depth indicator is not available yet in the World Bank data, and, and we think this is a nice way to combine uh, the two major uh, data collection efforts out there, which are DESTA and, and, and the World Bank database in, 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 uh, in one April, we start from DESTA and then we use the World Bank database to unpack uh, depth and introduce chapter and provision level indicators, which would be dummies equal to one if uh, between two countries there exists a PTA is active at time T that includes the relevant chapter or provision. Again, we will look at four uh, chapters, dispute settlement actually coming from DESTA, services investment and SOEs from the World Bank database, and then provision level uh, um, indicators, which will be organized, uh, uh, as I um, anticipated, according to three categories, WTO same, WTO plus, and WTO extra. Let me quickly go through them. Uh, we, will, we selected these uh, nine provisions uh, uh, across the services, SOEs, and investment chapter. This, this really gives a nice idea of how including a chapter is, uh, you know, to some extent, is a black box. You, you really need to, to go into the detail. the quality of the liberalization uh, implied in, 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 in that particular chapter. So, for instance, uh, while the investment chapter is, is inherently WTO extra, uh, the services chapter may be different things. It may uh, bring a, a complete overlap with the, with the regime at the WTO by, for instance, uh, uh, including an MFN provision or having a positive list approach for scheduling. Uh, the services chapter can also include the WTO plus provision uh, by uh, allowing for a negative list, list approach or by containing uh, provisions to discipline monopolies. Uh, the SOE's chapter, again, it can be many different things, can cover state trading enterprises, which is fully done uh, at, the, at the WTO as well. Uh, it can provide an obligation for SOEs to accord fair and equitable treatment, or uh, it can go uh, well beyond the WTO by requiring uh, SOEs to, um, to, to, to comply with certain transparency practices in terms of ownership, governance, and, and financial information. Um, and yeah, let me just quickly tell that the, the two remaining extra uh, W2 extra provisions come from the investment chapter and are about uh, uh, national treatment provision in the establishment uh, and acquisition phase of the investment and the MF, MFN treatment in the uh, establishment acquisition phase. Now, <clears throat> oh, sorry, voila. The baseline specification uh, that we use uh, uh, in, this, in this study to um, to estimate the, uh, the, the causal effect uh, of our treatments of uh, trade and, and GVCs um, related variables on uh, uh, the design of trade agreements are as follows. The, the, the depth uh, specification, it's a, it's a very simple linear model where you have depth uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have uh, uh, um, the treatment so, which can be total export, domestic value, or foreign value, and a bunch of fixed effects. So, so exporter time sector, import, import, um, importer time sector, and the exporter importer sector. Uh, for the um, dichotomous variables uh, um, um, of the chapter and provision specific indicators, we will use a linear probability model as a, as a, as a baseline with the same set of fixed effects. Now, <clears throat> these baseline specifications have severe endogeneity problems uh, simply because uh, there is a, there's a bunch of paper out there that actually uh, suggest that there is a, a, a lot of reverse causality going on. And uh, we take this into account by uh, adopting uh, an identification strategy based on the excludable instrument for trade and global value chain um, related variables uh, uh, that has been proposed by Carlo, Italo, and, and uh, the Paul Corsi in the 2018 paper. 
Uh, let me be very brief in, in explaining you the instrument as I, I assume you, you, know, you know that paper quite well already. Uh, if not, here's the, the basic intuition. So the instruments for uh, gross and value added trade uh, X um, are constructed as the respected predicted flow, which we call X hat from uh, a gravity equation, which we estimate with the PPML uh, featuring uh, uh, exporter time uh, sector, importer time sector, and uh, uh, exporter importer sector fixed effect, and uh, uh, this vector z, which is the interaction of three things. The first thing, uh, let me start from the center, log uh, max size. Uh, this uh, is uh, the uh, tracks of the increase over time of the maximum size of container ships uh, um, um, available. In this actually uh, increased uh, sharply during our uh, sample from uh, 5,000 TU to 15,000. This, this basically means that a container ship can accommodate 5,000 standard containers. And, and at the end of our sample, the, the largest ship can actually accommodate three times uh, the number of containers. This transportation, uh, this uh, technology shock uh, that reduces transportation cost is interacted with uh, <clears throat> a variable which, uh, uh, which measures the availability, the pre-sample availability of uh, deep water ports in partner countries. Deep water ports are ports where the depth of the water is, is, is deep enough to accommodate such large uh, uh, and big uh, container ships. And again, uh, there is a, an interesting variation in this, in this variable in the 40 uh, wider countries uh, in, in, in our China has uh, nine such ports, uh, Spain has eight, Germany one, uh, Italy has two, and, and we actually exploit the, this variation to, to generate uh, exogenous variation that we further interact with a, a vector <clears throat> of standard dyadic gravity variables. Now, the basic intuition behind the relevance and the excludability of, uh, of those instruments is as follows, and again, I, I refer to the to the uh, original uh, paper by Carlo Itano and Laura for further details. So that this instrument uh, is based on on the following intuition: the adoption of of larger ships decreases transportation cost. However, trade will respond relatively more toward partners endowed with more deep water ports. And and again, the final term in the interaction Z allows this shock to 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 shape bilateral flows differently depending on distance contiguity. Um, on the exclusion restriction, so what is what is uh, um, in order to satisfy the exclusion the exclusion restriction, we need to uh, make sure that conditional on controls and which which are uh, exporter time sector, importer time sector, and uh, uh, importer exporter sector fixed effects. Uh, the factors in the vector Z only affect the design of trade agreements through their impact uh, on on trade. And before moving ahead, let me just quickly discuss one, one, one potential threat, which is given by the, the, the possibility that I, country I, actually invests in a deep water port in country J, therefore creating incentives for, for the, the two countries to embed uh, investment provisions in, in, their, in their PTAs. And this, of course, creates a direct connection between the deep water port uh, variable and the design of trade agreements without going through the, the of uh, our uh, identification strategy, which is we restrict the analysis to ports which are active throughout the period uh, uh, under analysis from 1995 and 2007. And this actually imposes a constraint, this, this requirement imposes a constraint on the, on the uh, right hand side uh, uh, limit of our uh, time sample, because after 2007, actually, there has been quite a lot of activity in terms of dredging uh, by countries to create new deep water ports. So by restricting attention to uh, the years uh, until 2007, we are sure that all ports, um, but three are actually in, in, in all our sample, uh, have been operational throughout the sample. And this allows basically this tension to be limited uh, to, the, uh, to be constant over time and therefore be subsumed in the, in the, in the fixed effect, uh, which, which prevents violation of the exclusion. 
Fred, and uh, uh, tell you last few words on, on our estimation sample. Again, we cover 40 countries, up to 35 sectors. And uh, the, the trade policy um, information that, that ends up in our analysis uh, comes from those agreements that have been signed until 2007, where at least the two signatories belong to the sample of, of the 40 wired countries. And uh, in terms of the DESTA database, uh, we are uh, talking about 160 PTAs, uh, which accounts for 20% of the DESTA agreements signed until 2007. And when it comes to the WT, uh, to the World Bank uh, uh, database, we're talking about 24 uh, PTAs, 12.5% of uh, uh, the agreements uh, recorded in that database and signed until 2007. Uh, let me skip the summary statistics and, and move to the to the main uh, result for the depth specification. What you see here uh, are the three for the respective treatments, total export, domestic value, and foreign value. And the key result is that what really matters positively and statistically in, in a statistically significant way is uh, the foreign value added embedded in gross exports. This is the dimension of trade uh, and in particular of global value chains trade that has a causal impact on uh, uh, the depth uh, of PTAs, this particular dimension of the design of preferential uh, trade agreements. Now, let's uh, try to uh, interpret and understand this, this coefficient. Uh, uh, first, yes, we acknowledge that uh, our results show how foreign value is the key dimension um, impacting on, on PTA's design. And uh, this is uh, somehow consistent with the fact that um, foreign value added and bad in gross export actually capture the incentives of uh, economic actors which are active in global value bilateral trade relationship at stake. I'm talking about foreign suppliers to, um, to exporters in country I or multinational enterprises uh, uh, in, in, in the exporting country I, which are, uh, which are sourcing <clears throat> which are sourcing uh, intermediate inputs from their uh, uh, affiliates in, in, uh, in, in foreign countries other than, uh, uh, other than J. These actors will have uh, uh, the incentives to, to, uh, to make sure that the, relate, the, the, the trade integration between country I and J is, is actually deeper. And if we want to quantify our, our estimate, we can, we can think about the, 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 the following the following uh, thought experiment. If we increase the foreign value added in gross exports in any sector by two standard deviations, which, which amounts to approximately half a billion uh, US dollars, or to the difference between uh, the content of French sector level exports to Germany uh, and that of Lithuanian exports to South Korea with the French sector level export to Germany, um, being higher than, than that of Lithuanian experts to South Korea. The results in terms of uh, uh, higher uh, depth uh, of, the, of the PTAs uh, is uh, by 35, an increase by 35% of the sample average. No, so this is, this is a significant uh, increase and you can actually uh, quantify it um, in terms of existing agreements that uh, this, this difference uh, is the same that exists in the value of depth between uh, a rather shallow agreement signed uh, uh, in the mid 90s uh, uh, between EC and, and Jordan. It's the EC Jordan Euromed Association Agreement, which is at the 67th percentile of the whole distribution of, of depth in the DESTA database. And uh, uh, the level of depth other uh, uh, deep agreement, which is one of the, which, which, which is given by any of the uh, Europe agreement signed between the EC and the, and the Baltics, uh, which are actually paving the way for 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 um, um, for European integration, and uh, <clears throat> and these are agreements that uh, that are ranked uh, at the 78th uh, between the 78th and the 81st percentile of the distribution of depth in DESTA. Uh, now we have a bunch of corollary exercises in in the in the in the paper, uh, which I'd rather leave for uh, the Q&A afterwards. And let me move quickly to the, uh, to the second part of the empirical analysis where we unpack depth. And we actually look at uh, specific chapters and, and specific uh, uh, provisions. Now, the results on the chapters reveal substantial heterogeneity. So again, uh, let's focus on 
effect of foreign value, we see that uh, it has a positive impact on assigning a PTA that includes a, a dispute settlement chapter or an investment chapter, but it actually has a negative effect on, on, include, on signing a PTAs that includes a services chapter or SOEs chapter. Again, we interpret this as, as consistent with the idea that chapters are in a way uh, black boxes. And, and we, can, we can further unpack this by looking at specific provisions. And when we do so, we find that uh, global value chains trade, and in particular, the foreign value uh, added content of gross exports, have a positive effects on the probability of signing PTAs that includes provision that are either WTO plus or WTO extra. And uh, this is not the case for provisions which are merely overlapping with the, with the WTO, with the WTO regime. And let me, uh, so we have provided an empirical assessment of the causal effect of the trade and, and GVCs related variables on, on, on PTA's design. We, we use the novel identification strategy based on, on excludable instruments for gross and value added trade. <clears throat> We have shown that uh, GVC trade, and in particular, the foreign value added uh, content uh, in, of gross exports increase PTA's depth. And uh, uh, GVC trade, and to a, lesser extent, to a lesser extent, also gross exports, increase the probability uh, to sign PTAs with policy features that actually go beyond, beyond the WTO. And let me, let me stop here, thanks. Um, thanks, Matteo. Um, you're still sharing a screen. Yeah. Just... Wow. Okay, there. Great. Is it over? Um, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, we have a couple of minutes. If anybody has any questions or would like to make a comment, uh, just you can just jump in or let me know in the chat. Just to say, I'm looking forward to hearing from Nuno and uh, Anna Maria. I start to receive lots of emails. Thank you so much for various people about the paper. So this is, I mean, we are all, I think all of us were presenting very preliminary work. And so we are looking forward to get more inputs. Unfortunately, the, the format is very tight and there's not much time for interactions, but you know, really thanks for already the suggestions we got. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to more. And, and very cool papers, you know, we can talk Matteo and, 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 you know, I thought they were really cool, but yeah, it's too tight to, to have a quick, quick discussion. So I went, actually wanted to discuss with you the instrument of uh, Carlo and how you use it, um, uh, Carlo in Italo, but uh, yeah, let's have this discussion. We can Skype separately, Matteo. Hi, uh, I, I, had a, I had a question. Go ahead. Um, my, my question was regarding the, the time series dimension of the left hand side uh, of the depth and the individual indicators relating to depth. I do well understand that um, you use um, only those agreements that have been signed uh, during the period of investigation, but basically the IV matters. Uh, but uh, and, and, and of course, that rules out that any anything problematic could happen along the lines of the EU being a deep agreement that have been signed before the uh, IV basically uh, matters and the IV changes. Uh, but uh, it, it is still the case that some of the agreements that uh, the members of a deep agreement such as the EU and uh, the members of other agreements that they sign with third parties and those would be now new agreements uh, in terms of the counting uh, of, the, uh, of the databases that you use that those uh, deep agreements that are newly signed, say, after 1995, uh, they are deep because the parties that sign them are already tied in a deep agreement that sort of ties their hands to a certain extent uh, in terms of the design of an agreement they could sign. Uh, so the question is, isn't there an intricate issue with uh, predetermination in terms of what's deep and what's not deep uh, in a period that lies strictly before uh, the change in uh, the makeup of containerization um, that has to do with things that are just before the period. Yeah, 
thanks uh thanks please right this is an issue that that we need to take into account it is indeed the case that uh some country pairs uh, not only their their new uh trade agreements uh, or the the ones that are signed in the during the period of, that we observe uh, uh, reflect some deeper integration that happened before but but the, given the definition of our left hand side variable we actually have uh, uh, values of, of uh, depth uh, um, that that come from come from the past directly so this is something that we need that we need to uh deeply think about so yeah i don't have a, a, a solution for you uh, now but this is definitely something that we need to um that we need to um, offer a solution to so thanks for the comment okay well thanks everybody um uh for really interesting presentations and and, and great questions uh, just to close, I'm going to turn it over to Anna just for some closing remarks and maybe setting up for next week. Uh, yes, thank you, so thank you all very much, especially Paola, Meredith and Matteo for great presentations. It's It's been very interesting to see all these papers coming to life and we'll continue interacting, especially with the, you know, the review, uh, the reviewers who are going to give you comments and Michele and I will continue to, to, to interact with you. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention here, just in addition to thanking very much Dion, uh, is to also thank a few people behind the scenes who have been helping us, Ryan, Anna. Uh, they've been uh, really helpful and uh, Kun Ying. Um, so we'll continue to rely on them. And to tell you that there's three additional webinars coming uh, you know, over the next three weeks. Uh, and I hope to see you all, uh, uh, or many of you, over the next three weeks. So you will be receiving emails with the, uh, with the programs for, for the next uh, three weeks. So thanks a lot, everybody. And um, uh, yes, exactly. You can see in the chat, uh, those of you on WebEx, right now there's a link in the chat to see the next uh, three webinars. And uh, again, thank you all. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the great comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thanks. See you next week.